You know, I'm not gonna lie, your basement is the creepiest thing that I've ever seen. Hey guys, welcome back to the Dr. Cliff AUD vlog. This is vlog number 208, and today I am joined by my special guest, Dr. Steve Taddy from hereadvisor.com. Steve, thanks for joining me on the vlog today. Thanks for having me on. So you guys just missed out on us recording an awesome podcast episode, but don't worry, we're gonna be publishing that episode here probably in the next couple of weeks, maybe the next month or so. So make sure that you are subscribed to the channel with notifications turned on so you do not miss it, because in my opinion, opinion that is one of my favorite episodes that I've recorded up to this point probably because we're both nerds talking about <laughs> sound and all that so let me give you guys a little bit of an understanding here. So Hear Advisor is essentially a third-party testing lab of different hearing devices, over-the-counter and prescriptive level devices with a lot of different objective testing that they do right out of your basement. Absolutely. So was that a pretty good summary of what Hear Advisor is actually doing? Uh, yes, one thing we are also testing advanced earbuds. Advanced so earbuds too. Okay. And the future might even hold earplugs, sound bars, so we are looking to expand a little bit more. That's very cool. So, you know, give us a little bit of a background understanding of you and then about this project and where it is now and where you want it to go. Sure. So uh, I'm an audiologist. I have taught quite a bit over the past five years or so. I love the creative arts and I generally feel the most comfortable sitting somewhere between the creative side and then the scientific side of either acoustics or hearing sciences. And fortunately, I came across Dr. Abram Bailey, who runs Hearing Tracker, and then also Dr. Andy Sabin, who is a hearing scientist. And collectively, we kind of had this dream of making this independent lab that focused on objective metrics that were easy to understand uh, to help the average hearing aid consumer learn a little bit more about the vast array of technologies that are on the market nowadays. And that's cool. And you guys have five variables that you look at when you're testing devices. What are those variables? We do. So there's speech performance in quiet to moderately loud environments. There's speech performance in louder environments. There is the sound quality of your own voice. You know, if you plug your ear, you, you end up sounding like you're in a barrel. Uh, we have feedback control. So if you brush your hair, does the device squeal on you? And then last in kind of least, I guess, a little bit by our weightings is the audio quality of streamed music. And so you essentially put these hearing aids through a bunch of testing for these different variables, and you guys come up with a, the Hear Advisor sound score. So what is that score? Uh, what does that really mean when, when someone's looking at it to try to make a decision on if they should try a hearing product? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very complicated process analyzing these devices. and. Something that we've had to do is reach out to the community, both consumers and then providers, and try and figure out you know, what do they value most and what do they find most common in, in the real world. So we take those five key components, those are weighted mainly towards the speech, uh, speech and quiet and speech and noise. And then we also test devices in kind of an out of the box state, again, what most people experience. And then if they were to go to, let's say, uh, Dr. Cliff and have them perform, uh, have you perform real ear measurements. So all of that data, so five metrics across two different conditions, um, we, we weight that to create our sound score, which is supposed to be an easily digestible number that represents the overall performance that most people will experience with this device if they have the hearing loss that we use for testing. Very cool. So now that we've got that out of the way and you guys have some kind of general understanding of what you're doing with Hear Advisor right now, um, let's get a little bit behind the scenes. Stuff that maybe you wouldn't share with someone unless they were another professional like myself. Mm -hmm. So you have the basement, right? What were you doing in your basement before you started this project? Um, it was actually completely vacant. We had recently moved into the house and my, my thought was to build a recording studio down there. So we kind of landed pretty close to that. Uh, and, and now it's mainly built out to have one part kind of sound booth near anechoic space, kind of an onboarding testing room where we have like a test box and store all the devices. I'm actually building a theater on the other side of the lab right now and we might use that for testing sound bars with making some more mannequin recordings. But eventually, yes, the whole basement will just be Hear Advisor headquarters uh, with maybe a wind tunnel, a small wind yeah. tunnel, another sound sound box. You know, if I, and so I'm big into triathlon, so like if I bring my triathlon bike and if you build a wind tunnel, can I test my aerodynamics? 
uh, with your wind tunnel. Uh, you're welcome at here advisor anytime. Sweet deal, because obviously my family lives back in Illinois, so I, I manage, imagine it's just a matter of time before I find my way there uh, into your basement to check it out. Um, and it, it's just kind of funny, like that you literally have this like uh, commercial grade you know, anechoic chamber inside of your house in your basement, which mm -hmm. is crazy. It, it's a fun commute to work and it's uh, <laughs> kind of a dream come true to have all of this amazing uh, just audio equipment, not just like the space that is, you know, near anechoic. We have a mannequin in there. It's from Grass and it's the Keymar model. And uh, big thanks to Grass, they actually helped us update a lot of the components of it so that it's more modernized and records a much broader frequency response. We have an eight speaker array, which is just a fancy way of saying around our mannequin, we have eight speakers and that allows us to play back this really unique multi-track audio, multi audio format called Ambisonics. So it really is a dream coming from someone who's an audio engineer to have all of this in your basement. Yeah, yeah, totally cool. So now talk to me about like the build out process of that. Like what was that like? I mean, when you went to your, um, so your fiance, right? Were you guys, mm -hmm. were you guys engaged already when you wanted to start this project? Uh, no, we were not. Okay, so she's, uh, you've actually been able to turn your entire basement essentially into a uh, an anechoic chamber for testing hearing aids and she still decided to agree to marry you. I must be doing something. Right? <laughs> there we go. Know. So that's really cool. So like what was the discussion of like, okay, you you know what I think I'm gonna do? I think I'm gonna turn our basement into this testing lab. Uh, honestly, she's just a great person and she sees how passionate I am. I think she believes in the project as well. I, I know she believes in the project and she was, uh, she was and is still uh, very open and receptive to everything I do. So <laughs> I don't know, very sometimes cool. it's just a little bit too much work and she puts up with me. Yeah, so no, it's great. the same thing with my wife. She just puts up with the stuff <laughs> that uh, the projects I like to do. So um, now uh, when you were actually building, like how much time did it take for you to actually create this space? Um, well, fortunately I do have a background, a little bit of background in like architectural acoustics. I've actually helped build um, some recording studios in the past, so I had some previous knowledge on like wall structures and how to calculate the absorption coefficients or the reverberation time of room. So I was able to get kind of a, a target that I was aiming for and from there I worked back and built out some larger rooms, the ceiling. It, it ended up being a, a couple month process to, to get this done. Um, the whole structure is built more like a traditional recording studio where the walls are very thick. It's very heavy drywall with m multiple layers to try and stop sound from getting in. So when my HVAC system kicks on, yeah. that's not ruining the recordings or I don't have to kill uh, the, the heat to the whole house in the middle of winter, which yeah. is something I've done. Again, thanks to my <laughs> fiance for, not, uh, uh, for putting up with that. Um, but yeah, it's it kind of a multi-month process of just building it out slowly by myself and I had a little bit of help from my family, which was great. Very cool. So now um, you actually work with uh, Dr. Abram Bailey, yeah. Dr. Andy uh, Sabin. Uh, did they actually come over and help you carry the two by fours and the drywall and all that stuff down in your basement? Um, so unfortunately, uh, Dr. Abram Bailey has been out of the States for a while for uh, probably the the vast majority of the real build out of the basement so he has not been able to visit it uh, but uh, Andy Sabin he did come over a few times to help with analyzing and setting up and he's a, a whiz with programming so we were able to do a lot of that there in person which was was really fun. Very cool. Now, um, it just makes me go back to my time in grad school because I went to University of Illinois. You went to Northern Illinois mm -hmm. University um, but our clinic was in the basement and mm -hmm. there were times that I would go in and the sun was up and then I would like emerge into darkness and I'm like what happened mm -hmm. like do, do you ever go down into your basement to do to work for probably numerous hours on end and you come up and you're like what day is it it feels like most days yeah honestly <laughs> uh, you know fortunately now when the semester is going Tuesdays and Thursdays I'm out of the house actually around people and not just mannequins but uh, Yes, I, that definitely happens. And and I always think about like, what's the cost of building out something like that? Like, did the discussion happen of like, hey, we can either remodel our kitchen or we can build this chamber down in the basement? Like, like what kind of expense goes into something like that? Honestly, not as much as you might think. You know, drywall is relatively cheap. Two by fours, even though COVID sent them from costing three dollars to almost nine dollars. Oh wow! Uh, but you know, the, the cost is relatively relatively low, a uh, few thousand dollars to build the walls, add the uh, absorptive materials within the walls, and then add like a cloth covering over them so that all the fibers aren't getting out and it looks nice. So 
So it wasn't bad. And then you have all the cost of the technology, though, too, that you use. So like I know that Keymar head and torso mm -hmm. had to cost a certain amount of money. You've got the computers for the programming and all of that. So like when you're looking kind of all in, if you had to do just like a guesstimate of your initial investment, because I know that this is going to change over time as you mm -hmm. guys, you know, improve different aspects of it. But what do you think you would have committed to that? Uh, I may be way off, but it's probably somewhere in the ballpark of around twenty thousand dollars to, okay. to get going. Initially. Okay, so essentially a nice used car, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, and, and and it's commendable uh, that you guys have have committed that type of resource to this and. And to my knowledge, uh, you commit the resources to it just like any other like startup company would, right? Like you're like you invest in this capital expense, and then you don't make any money for a <laughs> period of time, uh, and then hopefully recoup it as time goes on. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about like the actual process that you go through with like. You get a, a set of devices in. I mailed you a set of devices for you to test so I could actually publish that in one of my review videos, your mm -hmm. sound score. And like, what happens when you get these devices, you have them in a box? Sure, well first, thank you for sharing the devices. Uh, but when we get them, the first thing I, I start with is the initial fitting, which is like kind of the first half. And this can be probably the most arduous portion of this because I have to learn the device. Uh, I don't know how it works, I don't know what the app is, how well the two pair together, so uh, a considerable amount of time is just me figuring out how to get the device to work the way I want it to work. And then once I have my head wrapped around that and it's paired with my phone and all that, um, I will get it positioned on our mannequin, Keymar, and I will start looking at how the device fits and plugs up the ears of the mannequin. And this is what is it, what's called a, a real ear occluded insertion gain. So it, it's kind of like real ear occluded response, but it's a difference between Kimar's normal ears and then the occluded response. And basically what this does is it shows us how much the devices plug up the ears, which is really important when you're thinking of a binaural recording with two of them. Yeah. You wanna make sure that one, the occlusion is realistic to what would happen on a human. And then it's equal between the ears. So when you take measurements, it, it's accurate yeah. across both of them. You know, it's kind of interesting because like occlusion uh, is like, like if you guys were to plug your ears with your fingers and talk, you'd be like, oh man, my voice is really boomy and loud to myself. Um, you don't really want that effect when you're wearing hearing aids, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the other side of that, which is the more that you occlude your ears, the more you trap in low frequencies if you're streaming audio, so it actually gives like music a better sound quality. So it's Absolutely. kind of like a double-edged sword with that a little bit. There are loads of trade-offs and counteracting trade-offs with our metrics and that's something that you will see if you have a more occluding device like Apple AirPods Pro for example uh, it tends to have more ba a better bass response and then music sound quality will sound better but then the own voice metric that we have that tends to go the opposite so there's an inverse relationship between a lot of these and that's just one of the fun complexities that we end up dealing with in hearing sciences. So you go through these, this occlusion testing, this fit testing, then, then what's the next step in sure. that? Sure. Once I've confirmed that both devices are, are working, they're fitting Keymar in the same way, then I turn on the gain uh, and I look at the real ear insertion gain. So basically on Keymar's ears, how, what, what, what volume are the devices performing across the spectrum? And the nice thing is uh, we have a MATLAB program that allows us to monitor basically the sound through Keymar's ears in real time. So with our speakers, I'm able to present speech, monitor the input, make adjustments to either the, the phone app or software if the device has it, and tune it kind of what would be um, just based on our hearing loss that we use, which is an N3 hearing loss, 35 to 65 dBHL sloping loss pretty much. Very cool. So you get that done, and I know that you're spending literally hours on these devices. How long, uh, how much time do you think it takes you to get up to that point in the testing? You know, it really depends on the device. If it is a traditional like receiver in canal or behind the ear with an open fit, um, that process can take 20 minutes. For some other devices where it is extremely occluding, I've actually had it take me somewhere, I, I don't understand how, but like two, three hours, yeah. just to get the device performing the way that I think it should for the initial recording. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. And so then you're uh, essentially, you focus a lot on the speech and noise aspect. Anytime you ask anyone with hearing loss, it's like, what do they want to do? Well, uh, of course they all want to hear speech and quiet, like that's a given, like you definitely want to get that. But how do you guys evaluate the speech and noise performance with these devices? That's a great question. So it's not a proprietary metric. It's actually something that comes from the scientific community. And I believe it's out of University of Colorado. And it's called HASPI. 
and it stands for the Hearing Aid Speech Perception Index. And this is a metric that models the auditory system so we can type in our hearing loss or input our hearing loss. And then it, it's called intrusive where it's gonna make a comparison to some controls. So we make a, a recording through Keymar across our 72 scenes. We put that into Haspi and then we make the same recordings but with devices on Keymar. So this algorithm is basically able to compare the two and look at things like audibility, signal to noise ratio improvements, fine temporal structures, the overall envelope. And then what it does is it predicts the speech intelligibility benefits that you might get if you were wearing that device. And so that gives you an apples to apples comparison with other devices if you run through it through the same testing protocols, right? So it allows you to almost like do a direct comparison of different devices. Right, and it'd be great to have people doing these type of tests, like bringing them and, and having them, but um, that doesn't scale to the level that we are at right now. So yes, with our setup with Keymar, the speakers using these metrics like Haspi, and there's some other models like that, it allows us to keep things consistent across every single device so it's a really fair comparison. And the only variable is the device. And so now when you're streaming, so I'm an Android guy. Mm -hmm. Are you an Apple guy or an Android I'm, guy? I'm Apple. You're Apple, okay. So when you're doing streaming like sound quality measures, like what are you streaming from? So I am streaming from my phone. Okay. And what we have is kind of a, you can think of it as like a blueprint of what good might sound like through Apple AirPods Pro or through traditional headphones. And that's kind of our benchmark that we're going for. So while I'm adjusting, or while I'm streaming audio from my phone to a device, I'm again looking at a MATLAB program that's outputting in real time what Keymar is hearing, and I adjust the volume to at least match um, the gain at 1000 hertz of that other recording that would be deemed a, a good audio quality. I gotcha, I gotcha. And so you could expect if, if I was streaming from my Android device that you would be able to achieve the same type of result. Absolutely, I mean, because the protocols are the same or they should be relatively similar across these and it's just a matter of us matching the overall volume between them so that when you switch between one device or the next, that it's not you preferring one just because it's louder, which okay, is something yeah. that would tend to happen. Yeah, yeah, totally understandable. So you get through with all this different testing that you do, and, and how many hours on average do you think it takes you to go from beginning to end, and how many parameters did you say like you're actually, like how many actual measurements are you running? So there's, there's 72 scenes that we record. It comes down to 12 different environments. There's like cafe, restaurant, church. There are three different talker situations. There's one person, there's two, and then there's one, two, and three. And then what we did is, in, we, I actually made these recordings in a studio. We actually rotate which voice actor or actress was saying the script. So it gives us 72 scenes, and all of that's analyzed down to those five metrics across two different conditions, initial, and tuned. So there's a lot of different testing that you're doing and then time frame of doing that. Like on average, I know it's different for different devices, but on average, what would you say? Um, it, it can be somewhere around three to four hours for a device that is uh, being nice to me. Very cool. And then once you get all of that data, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. who, who does it go? Does it go to Andy? Does it go to Abram? Does it, do, does it stick with you? <laughs> so a lot of the times it ends up going through these algorithms like Haspi. So that part is a little bit um, kind of automated. Okay. Some of the measurements we do need to go back and double check. For example, like feedback. For that measure, that's where I'm actually taking my hands and moving them past Keymar's ears and cupping the pinna like an individual might do in the real world if they're holding a phone. For those, we actually, it's a little bit more time intensive because we do blind listening tests. And that's something that we're trying to maybe improve how we can analyze this metric. But once we have all these recordings uh, across devices, we listen to them and each one of us is able to rate on a scale how we feel that device performed with feedback. We average across them and that gives us our score. Very cool. And so then how long does it take to go and actually do all these recordings? You evaluate the essentially all the measures, you kind of grade it, scale it, you know, weight it, all of that. How long does it take before it actually gets published on the website? You know, depending on our schedules, because for all of us, this is more of a passion project and we all, I guess you could say, have real jobs or just other jobs and this is something that we're doing um, between waking moments. But sometimes turnaround can be extremely quick. We're like a week, I test a device and uh, we get it processed and then it's available. Very cool. And so then it goes on the website. We have this uh, Hear Advisor sound score, mm -hmm. uh, which goes anywhere from I've learned today, anywhere from five, which is the highest score that you can get to negative, like in the zeros, if a device like just performs so bad to where it actually makes your hearing worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you have the, let, let's talk about the sound score a little bit and, and what that ultimately means and what your intent of that was for the hearing industry. 
Sure. So it, it, it is a very complicated process to try and objectively measure hearing aid performance. So what we are regularly doing is reaching out to individuals with hearing loss and providers and trying to figure out what are appropriate weightings or scales between the different elements that we're measuring here. And it, it's always important to focus or to realize as well that we're focusing only on quality, not things like how easy is the device to use, how comfortable is it in your ear, though our occlusion metric kind of approximates that. Yeah, so the ultimate goal then of our sound score is to provide one number that takes all of those other numbers and simplifies it in a way that, it, again, should represent what most people will experience in the real world. So it's something that we had discussed before. We know that audiologists don't routinely perform realer measurements. And then also most people will like- And we like, don't like those. We, like we, we, we want everyone to be following best practices. The unfortunate fact of the matter is, is that that is the exception, not the rule. Right. Yeah. So yeah, sorry to interrupt, no, but I just like- that, PSA that bird, Like, I mean, I wouldn't be doing literally what we're doing right now if every provider was following best practices. Right. So, um, so it really kind of helps people understand like if best practices are not going to be followed on the initial fit measure, mm -hmm. um, this is some level of expectation that you could have with this device. Absolutely. Very yeah. cool. And so then, I mean, it seems like a way to almost like keep the industry honest, right? From an OTC perspective, from a, even prescription hearing aid perspective, am I right? It, it could be. Um, we're, I think our minds are always more focused on the consumer, the individual with hearing loss, and what can we do to make their journey as easy as possible. Uh, the, the least difficult route to finding a device that will offer them the greatest benefit. But if a side effect of that is uh, more akin to what you generally do and kind of holding people accountable for not performing these basic measurements that we know improve outcomes, uh, that is obviously something that we, that's great. Yeah, yeah, right on. So like, what do you think is gonna end up coming of this project? Like if it could, uh, I know that you teach, I know that you, you have other projects that you work on, but if this really turns into what you guys want it to be, is this your full-time thing? Um, it, it very well could be. You know, there are other companies like uh, DxO Mark, and they are very, they, they do similar evaluations, very thorough for things like cameras and laptops. And they are regularly referenced by the manufacturers and they're very proud if they get an award or if they score well. So our goal down the line would just be to have maybe more of like a consortium of researchers and or manufacturers and all were working together to provide these metrics and they're as accurate as possible, which is where we're on the road to already. So the ultimate goal would just be that the score and our overall metrics are well known and we have a, a better proven case that they are helping people and then companies are willing to work with us and manufacturers, um, other groups that are out there, they're willing to work with us and ultimately find the metrics that will continue to provide more information. And a part of that might just be expanding our metrics more and more. As I've mentioned before, we're testing only one hearing loss right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's something that we would love to do and expand that to a broader range of hearing losses as well as a broader range of technologies too. Very cool. So you're saying that someday maybe this lab that you have is not in your basement anymore. Mm -hmm. It's in like a commercial facility or something like that. That would that could be a future, yes. That's very yeah. cool, very cool. Well, Steve, thank you so much for taking some time here on the vlog. Guys, if you wanna catch the full episode of the Dr. Cliff Show, where I'm basically grilling you about all <laughs> the different aspects of this particular project, make sure that you're subscribed to the channel with notifications turned on. And if you like this little discussion that we have, make sure that you hit that like button. And as always, we will see you next week.